My name is Adam Roberts. Uh, Emily and I run a, a multifamily real estate business today, and uh, and we come from uh, engineering operations and manufacturing background. Uh, so both of us worked at General Electric, um, had a, had a corporate career going uh, in our in, in our early careers, and um, when that changed about 10 years ago or so, uh, we started looking into real estate investing, uh, knew it was something that could, uh, you know, sustain a lifestyle and, and um, you know, build generational wealth. And so we, we, we really dove uh, head in. We got into single family investing, did a lot of home renovations, had a small rental portfolio, and in 2017 uh, decided to take the step into uh, multifamily real estate. And from there, we've, we've, we've built a uh, We've built a business uh, just north of $200 million in, in assets under management. Uh, we also invest very heavily in, in some of our colleagues' uh, deals as well. So we're, we're pretty prolific, limited partner investors. Um, and beyond multifamily, we're heavily involved in mortgage note investing and uh, industrial triple net uh, investments as well. So uh, diversifying a, a little bit outside of the multifamily world. So when I heard that some of you were also involved in, in those in those things, uh, I, I, I really can appreciate that. <clears throat> uh, today, I'd like to speak a little bit about the, the multifamily market's current state from my perspective. Uh, I, I attended a very, very good presentation uh, put on by um, Marcus and Millichap, which I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with. And I, uh, I, I just couldn't help myself. I had to take some slides from their presentation and, and, and I want to give kind of my perspective around some of the data that they show. Uh, I've also sprinkled in some of my, my own insights here. And then near the end of the presentation, I want to talk a little bit about what I feel uh, makes a good apartment operator in, in today's climate especially since we're dealing with things like um, fluctuating market fundamentals, variable rate loans, uh, and things that many of you folks talked about here during your introduction. So uh, we'll start off with a little bit of the market, uh, talk about interest rates and debt, and then we'll finish with my thoughts on, on what makes a good apartment operator. Um, so right off the bat from the highest level, and really for those of you that are involved in multifamily investing, this will make a lot of sense. Uh, this this is our demographic. This is the folks that are you know a significant part of our clientele in this age range uh, between say uh, meeting your spouse and purchasing your first home. Uh, this is where most of our most of our residents live is in our in our apartments. Um, I will say some of the trends that we're seeing real time today. Um, a lot of a lot of company and business movement to the Sun Belt bringing a lot of young professionals to places like Phoenix, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, the Florida markets, uh, areas like that. And um, different, I would say different today than it was maybe 10 to 15 years ago when, when say I was an apartment dweller. Uh, folks in their 20s and early 30s are extremely interested in, in luxury apartment living. Uh, that is a huge theme today. Uh, we've had just a lot of apartment construction over the past several years in the luxury, you know, in the new build, new construction, luxury realm. An interesting stat for every for every uh, family or person that rents a luxury apartment, there's two, three, four families that need to support that white collar employee or entrepreneur, and so. You know, you might, you have the A-class apartment space, the luxury apartment space, but then you also have the B and C-class apartment space, um, which is where um, Emily and I are heavily invested. Uh, you know, apartments built in the 80s and 90s, not necessarily luxury new build. But this is, this is our demographic today, and, uh, and, it's, and it's a big part of the population. Kind of another interesting takeaway that is building on apartment demand is the fact that since the Great Recession, uh, with uh, our you know mortgage-backed securities uh, issues of of late two th late two thousand eight two thousand nine, we have not really recovered uh, nationally on home construction. And I, I heard some of you are involved in development, and maybe you see this in your own business. Uh, we we haven't even recovered to the twenty to thirty year time frame, and we see a significant amount of that here in Dallas-Fort Worth. They just can't build homes fast enough. 
Um, if any of you are involved in, in retail, residential, real estate brokerage, you might see this as well. Uh, folks who, uh, you know, multiple offers on pre-existing homes, just, you know, over and above asking price. You know, there might have been a little blip during COVID, but, you know, in, in a lot of the high demand markets where people are moving, that's completely reset. Uh, we're back to multiple offers, you know, within certain price ranges. And, and again, uh, just can't build homes fast enough. Homes have become very expensive to build with inflation. And so all this equates to good apartment demand. One, one other, uh, I would say stark, uh, data point that is, uh, I would, you know, more or less obvious today. Uh, when we discuss the debt markets and the ability for folks to actually afford even a starter home, um, those homes have become relatively unaffordable today. And where apartments and starter homes were more or less within a one to $300 price gap, say, hey, I could rent an apartment for $1,000 a month. Or if I kind of stretch my budget, I could buy, buy a home and my mortgage would be in, in the $1,300 to $1,500 a month range. Well, that, that's completely changed. And uh, with the significant ramp up in residential home mortgage interest rates, it's, it's, uh, the, the rents behind that in the apartments have not kept up with that. Right? I, I have not been able to go to my clientele in my apartment portfolio and say, well, you know, because the uh, the home prices have gone up 300, 400 percent, we're going to increase all your rents by six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month. That's just that's not happening. However, it has created a significant supply demand issue uh, in the marketplace for apartments. And um, I'll never forget uh, right around the time uh, the Fed started to increase the federal funds rate uh, with with. Uh, with significance last year, I would be sitting in some of our apartment offices, um, meeting with our staff, and one person after another would be coming into the office saying, hey, I was shopping for a home, and now I can no longer afford it. That was a huge theme. Uh, and yeah, of course, we have a great product, so we're going to take advantage of that and uh, and give those folks a great place to live. Uh, I have a couple scatter plots here in the United States, just uh, pictorial. Um, again, nothing that's that's significantly obvious. This group um, seems extremely well versed in real estate, and so I think you're probably seeing a lot of this in in your own businesses. But um, companies, businesses are moving to these markets that are in the green circles. They're bringing their employees with them. Uh, we're seeing a significant trend in, in that manner. Um, people moving from the Rust Belt, people moving from the coasts. Uh, here, you know, we're in the markets that we work, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston. Uh, we're just seeing a lot of influx. And, uh, and not a week goes by where, where I'm not reading about another company that's moving to Texas. Supply demand uh, comes with that. And so we've been seeing pretty, pretty significant rent growth over the past uh, several years. And uh, again, you know, COVID was a little bit of a blip, but a lot of us took a, a bit of a pause there, uh, ourselves included. But uh, things things have uh, have really reset since then in the past couple of years. Um, I've got another chart here coming up showing some of the statistics on a property in our portfolio as it relates to this data right here. So I'll, I'll save a few comments for that. Well, here it is. Um, so. Uh, we purchased a uh, property in Fort Worth uh, about three years ago, uh, going on four years ago, and it's in the North Fort Worth suburbs. It's a 240-unit uh, B-class property in the Fort Worth suburb, Eagles Point Apartment Homes. It's um, uh, we purchased it for around 35 million dollars three years ago, and today today it's worth low 40s. And um, it's just a, a great little property. And again, when I talk about, you know, um, th this is not a property we, where we've got, um, let's say, uh, 20 somethings uh, with two college degrees and a six figure income necessarily. That, that'd be more of your, your luxury apartment living. Um, th this is more working class uh, wage earners, uh, you know, folks who have a household income somewhere in the neighborhood of, let's call it 75 and $100,000 a year. 
And um, and here's just a couple statistics. I, I pulled this a couple nights ago when I was uh, putting my charts together to to show, you know, the Marcus Millichap data points um, are, are are the real deal. Uh, we haven't. We haven't really dipped below a 95% occupancy on, on this property. And uh, in fact, the average uh, since we bought the property has been roughly 97%. Um, a, a good performer and no issues, uh, you know, bringing people to the leasing office to, to sign leases. And then there's, there's some of the rent growth statistics. I put a rent growth figure in there and that's going to be um, organic rent growth on, on uh, new leases. And then I have a renewal uh, growth number in there, which is, you know, residents living in the community prior to our takeover in which we had to renew a lease, you know, their lease renewed and, and what type of increase was, was received there. And so, yeah, you know, someone who's paying say $1,200 a month for a two bedroom apartment, uh, uh um, it, it's going to be, you know, paying 150 to $200 more a month, um, for that unit. And, you know, no issues. They're 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 uh, they're not doing a lot of shopping, as you can see from the occupancy perspective. And so, um, it's been it's been um, quite interesting to to see this take place in our market. You know, and, and I'll I'll get into this a little bit here in a minute when I talk about a good apartment operator from my perspective. Uh, none of us none of us really underwrote this type of performance. We 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 haven't uh, we didn't take it to the bank when we bought the property. And so that's been uh, that's been a real nice thing for us is is to just take advantage of the organic market fundamentals, not necessarily make commitments on it or or take advantage of it from a um, from an acquisition pricing perspective. Uh, stay pretty conservative and and hey, if people want to move to Texas and live in our apartment units, then we'll we'll definitely have them. Let's dive a little bit into the debt side uh, that I see from from where I sit. Uh, we, uh, Emily and I, have uh, have had a variety of different debt structures on our multifamily communities. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, fixed rate agency debt. Um, we've had a lot of variable rate bridge financing, and we've had some uh, private bank, small community bank. Um, basically business loans, uh, commu community real estate loans. And uh, they, they all have a very different flavor. Um, bridge loans were very popular here the past several years so that you could get into deals with uh, minimal, minimal exit prepayment penalties. Um, and, but so we, so we have a variety. And, uh, and, and from a high level, folks who have gotten into the variable rate financing, ourselves included, um, for people who have a long-term vision and, you know, have a, a business, let's say that's built conservatively, you know, we were always under the assumption rates were going to go up. I think everybody, you know, no one was in this business saying, Hey, I, I can't wait to invest in real estate with 2% interest rates on, on my debt for the next 15 years. I, I think we were all kind of waiting for the day to come. I think, I think what was different is not a lot of folks saw it coming as quickly as it did, right? I, I think the ramp up was unprecedented. Um, if you look at historical interest rate fluctuations going, you know, dating back decades and decades. Um, but, uh, you know, when I went to the Marcus and Millichap discussion, it, it, it's very interesting to look at how the Fed is responding and some of the metrics they look at. I think this group is probably very familiar with some of the metrics that the Fed considers. Um, on the apartment side, and I'm sure it's very similar on, on, on many other commercial loan types, you know, th there's, I would say a lot more emphasis put on some other metrics like 10 year treasury notes and things of that nature when it comes to, you know, I interest rate indications. But at the end of the day, uh, the fed has really pushed based on their core consumer price, uh, data. And so that's where we're at today. It's anybody's guess what's going to happen here in the next, uh, several months. I know our group has really assumed that we're kind of here to stay more or less. I don't think any of us are assuming that we're going to be heading back down to where we were. Um, at adding to the stress level was the various, uh, banking issues that we've now had, uh, throughout 2023. Um, and I think this, this surprised a lot of folks. It caused a lot of lenders to tighten up in our space. 
I know um, 2023 has not been a year of transactions, which I'm going to show here in a minute. But even on the, uh, let's call it five to 10 properties that Emily and I have um, pursued aggressively this year, uh, the the debt financing was anywhere but solid. Uh, usually, usually you can walk into these these deals making offers, get into a second round of offers. You know your financing is more or less determined, right? Your financing is locked up. <clears throat> it's not the case right now. Um, banks, lenders are they are on the sidelines and and just waiting basically for the closing day. And so that, that puts a lot of risk on the, on the buyer, on the person making the acquisition, right? Um, banks are really, really protecting their balance sheets. They're working with known entities and they're looking very, very heavily at the deal. And so, and I, and I can't blame them, right? There's, there's, some, there's some funny stuff going on out there. Some banks did get into some awkward positions with you know, US treasuries and bonds and things of that nature. Um, but that's just what we're dealing with. Uh, debt is not easy today. But at the at at the end of it, I, I think uh, from my perspective, and, and I think many of you will probably agree, we're we're operating today really really at a, a historical number. And uh, when I went to this talk uh, that M and M gave, that was that was more or less the consensus in the room. Uh, this is not you know, historically high interest rates today. I mean, I think we'd all prefer them to be a little bit closer to where they were a couple years ago, but, um, you know, folks who have a long-term vision, who are, who are in the business um, to create generational wealth and, and, and a, and a long-term portfolio, I, th I think just we, we need to get comfortable with where we're at right now, where we are today. Um, there are data points that's, that point to rates easing a bit more here in the next couple years, but, um, you know, barring any sort of significant uh, economic issue, um, you know, the underwriting, the property fundamentals uh, most likely are going to have to reflect interest rates in the in the fours, fives, six percent. I think that's I think that's where we're operating today. Um, we'll see what happens with the Fed here over the coming months. <clears throat> This chart doesn't show it extremely well, but if we if we look on the you know 20, 2021 to twenty twenty three, you know that's that ramp up there. And, and if you look at some of the other ramp ups in the prior years um, or in the prior decades, I should say, it's not as aggressive. It, the the aggressive ramp ups really where I think um, people got caught flat footed a bit. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about interest rate cap insurance here in a bit, but you know, the folks who underwrite a lot of the insurance policies against interest rate volatility, you know, they publish charts as well. And, and it, it, it's a little bit of a, you know, tongue in cheek here because this, uh, you know, the past year or so you could almost put any date you wanted on the horizontal axis. Um, it's kind of looked this way now for the past, let's call it eight to 12 months. Where everybody has this uh, fleeting hope that interest rates will kind of ease a bit. Uh, however, that's that was pulled. I pulled this a couple nights ago, and it basically says, "Hey, if you're going to bet money on insurance policies, then we are likely to see a peak here shortly." And uh, take that for what it's worth. I, I wouldn't include it in my underwriting necessarily, <laughs> but um, but that's uh, that's one data point. And and again, um, holistically from a very high level, I think it can be, you know, more or less taken to the bank that, hey, maybe interest rates will ease a bit and, you know, maybe we won't skyrocket uh, any any further. Spent a couple minutes here uh, before I get into uh, apartment operations, just talking about transactions uh, in, in Texas and, and nationwide. Again, uh, coming from the M&M &M database here, uh, and we're certainly feeling this. I mean, in in our in our operations, Emily and I, um, we we're not a we're not a significant apartment acquisitions company. I mean, we we will do three four acquisitions a year in a good market, and um, we haven't we haven't acquired anything um, since August of twenty twenty two, so twelve months now, and where we would ordinarily be making 
you know, three, four offers a month in a good market. Uh, we've made, you know, like I said, six offers, seven offers in 2023. So it's, it's, it's down severely. Um, a good friend of mine, a big broker in Dallas, Fort Worth said that, uh, you know, he closed uh, upwards of 80 apartment deals in 2022 and he's only closed four so far in 2023. So, uh, definitely the fundamentals that we kind of reviewed there a bit are at play interest rates, uh, and, and the, the debt scenarios not being, um, to the buyers, uh, you know, favor are, are really keeping buyers at a different price point than the sellers. Um, you know, a seller is going to tell you, Hey, my property's worth 50 million. And a buyer is going to look at his options on debt along with some of the fundamentals staying pretty conservative in the market and say, Hey, you know, I think your property is worth 45 million. And the seller says, okay, well then I'm not a seller. And that's happening. That's happening all over the market. Uh, there's nothing that's really holding the sellers accountable uh, to the pricing discrepancies until they have to make a capital decision, right? And until their debt comes due or, you know, their equity wants to sell the deal. Um, so right now a seller, you know, sellers just aren't sellers today. Uh, there, there, there really isn't a pricing agreement and we're seeing a pretty, a pretty large disagreement. I would say anywhere from five to 10% uh, of, uh, acquisition price between where the buyers feel it is today and, and where the sellers feel it is. Um, you know, I, th I found this to be interesting uh, when when the market does kind of heat back up and things pick back up and lenders start to participate again, um, where the past, call it uh, 10 plus years of, uh, you know, buyers uh, are, and, and it really is in the, in the private space, uh, you know, folks like Emily and myself and, and our equity investors, um, to date, we, we have not worked with any um, equity groups or, you know, private groups or institutional or anything, anything of that nature. All, all of our equity comes from just uh, relationships, pri private equity. So we're in that, um, in that blue bar. So it, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see how that happens and, and, and to what extent the institutional players participate when things open back up. Uh, the folks at Marcus Millichap remained bullish um, that the private um, buyer groups will maintain a, a larger portion of the pie, but it really depends. You know, um, we have a little bit different criteria, I would say, than the institutional folks. Um, and we can, you know, we're a little bit more nimble uh, through through various market cycles, but um, let's see. You know, the other the other side of the coin says there might be a lot of a private investor groups that, that may have gotten in over their head uh, the past couple of years with debt and potentially equity. And, um, and so we'll just have to see. Really the big elephant in the room, that's a good segue. The big elephant in the room is the, um, is, is the debt that might be coming due or is coming due over the next couple of years. And, and I think John, um, uh, kind of talked about this a little bit. Uh, there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, rescue funds, debt restructuring, uh, refinancing and equity restructuring and property takeover, you know, you name it, um, occurring, I think over the next couple of years, this chart tells you why a lot of investors got into short term financing, variable rate financing without the proper protections in place, uh, potentially hoping that property performance would really keep them safe. And, um, and maybe property performance isn't doing as well as, as uh, anticipated. Anyway, that's, that's, a, that's a real deal. That's going to be happening. It's already happening. We have uh, a couple <coughs> folks in our network. I've already seen a couple properties go to the bank um, with, you know, other uh, apartment investors that, that we know. And so it's a unfortunate reality. I think that's how the reset's going to happen. Um, but, you know, going back to that pricing disagreement, Nothing's really going to make the seller move unless they have a, a reason that they have to. And I think a lot of that is on this page right here over the next couple of years. We're going to have a lot of debt maturities, a lot of loan maturities um, where banks um, maybe not, not wanting to participate in a refinance scenario or a loan extension or, or you know, something like that. So 
And finally, uh, for the M&M slides, and I'll move on to a couple of slides that I put together about apartment operators, but, but here's, here's just another indication of the, the pricing disagreement, right? The orange line being 10-year treasury, a, a significant indicator, back indicator of interest rates for commercial loans. And then uh, blue line being cap rates or you know uh, the yield, let's call it the yield that the investor's willing to um, invest in. And really, at no other time in history, uh, dating back a long, long time, I mean, it got close back during, you know, 06, 07, 08. Um, we just have a, a, a real crunch between where the, where the let's call it the, the lender's rate is and where the investor's yield expectation is. And um, investors for a long time have been willing to accept lower and lower yields for their multifamily investments throughout the whole 20 teens. Um, and now interest rates have finally um, just come straight up to that. And, and that's really, I would say, from a high level, uh, why we're seeing a lot of the market conditions we're seeing. It's, hey, you know, my, my investors, if I'm going to buy your $50 million property, my investors expect a certain rate of return. We're, because, of, because of how tight we are now with, with um, you know, on this chart, the 10-year treasury, but with how tight we are on debt, and I need to make the numbers work. Uh, I'm just not willing to go below a certain threshold. So, we, you know, we are seeing cap rates start to just creep up ever so slightly, even in, in a hot market like Dallas Fort Worth. Um, and so, hey, I can't offer you 50 million for that property. I, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to make my final offer at 45 million, or I'll see you next year, right? So, um, so yeah, uh, it's just a great little chart to show kind of the the nuances of that conversation. Um, let's, uh, wrap up with a couple charts here on apartment operations. I, in our business, uh, between Emily and myself, I focus primarily on, um, operations. Uh, once we acquire a property, I work, uh, hand in hand with our management teams to ensure property performance, budgets, you know, you name it, right? Um, if, uh, if we've got a problem with it, with a, uh, with a property, um, you're going to call Adam. So, um, really today, you know, fixed rate debt, great, no problem, you know, set it and forget it. Uh, the, you know, there's challenges down the road with, with those type of deals uh, as far as prepayment penalties and things of that nature. But focusing on the here and now, you know, variable rate loan deals, uh, I, myself included, I'm invested in a handful of deals, not only our own, but other people's deals where we're just dealing with the variable rate loan issues. And the three, I'd say, pillars to success, the three things we focus on, the three things you must have are right here on the, on the page. And so I'm going to go through each one. And again, this is just kind of my personal stance on this and how we operate our business. The first one's really a no-brainer, although I know plenty of folks in 2020 and 2021 that acquired properties without interest rate cap insurance. Um, although this group seems extremely versed in this, for those who don't know, uh, when you buy a, a, an apartment community or you know any piece of real estate with variable rate financing, um, available to you is an insurance policy that you can purchase to ensure that as rates fluctuate, uh, your rate won't go above a certain threshold, right? Above a certain spread over the basis that you bought um, the debt at. And so, of course, smart, smart investors will participate in this. Um, if you're going to buy a variable rate uh, loan, uh, buy a deal with variable rate loan, you're going to buy this type of insurance policy. Uh, we're actually looking at buying um, or re renewing an insurance policy on one of our deals. And we got a quote back last week. They are expensive today because the underwriters are still seeing massive volatility in the debt markets. And so if I want to insure a $25 million loan today, it's going to cost me north of a million dollars. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a small chunk of change. Uh, these, are, these are costs you have to think about when you buy the property, right? To protect yourself during the ownership period. And like I said, we're buying, we're, we're renewing one. So you have to have those funds available during the ownership period. So it's a big, it's a big cash item uh, to have sitting on the sidelines. For that reason, a good apartment operator is going to have, you know, just 
really, really solid balance sheet strategy. I mean, they're going to have a, an every 30 day review of every balance sheet for all of their properties and have a strategy going forward. Right. Um, it's a lot, it's a reason why a lot of folks, ourselves included, are not making investor distributions on properties that have interest rate insurance cap payments coming up, right? So this deal I just mentioned, we're gonna be paying out probably another uh, insurance cap, um, interest rate cap here in several months. Unfortunately, the property is doing great. It's generated well over a million dollars of uh, distributable investor dividends, um, on, but, for our purpose and the investment health, we're holding onto those funds just because we need those for our balance sheet purposes. Um, and, uh, and and a good apartment operator is going to prioritize, you know, their their cash reserves. They just are during a period of uncertainty. It's it's just um, it's something that we all need to do. Um, here's just some real numbers from uh, from a property in our portfolio. Again. Uh, mid forties, uh, million dollar deal in North Dallas suburbs. And, um, yeah, so, so there's that, uh, interest rate cap insurance, uh, two year quote, uh, North of a million dollars on a property that generates $5 million in annual revenue. So n not a small number, a substantial number. Um, and for that reason, when we, you know, when we go into our variable rate, debt deals at the very beginning, we do keep a significant amount of cash in reserves from the get-go. Um, you know, that money always finds a way to, to, uh, to go and improve the property, or in this case, um, it works as a buffer for us to, um, you know, to afford the volatility of the interest rate in debt markets. Um, finally, and, and you know, you could say if you're a, if you're an experienced real estate investor, you could say, Hey, this kind of goes without saying, but you, you know, you'd be surprised. There's a lot of folks in, in the business and, um, during, during these times, you know, again, we're a little bit of uncertainty. We feel like we're claw, clawing our way out of, out of, uh, our, our economic, um, reset, but, uh, from, from before you buy the deal all the way till you you close on it as a sale. Uh, operational excellence needs to be at the forefront. It just absolutely does. There needs to be an operating rhythm between the partnership group, you know, whoever is accountable for the investment and the, the management company. Um, I, I, I just see a lot of missing puzzle pieces as far as that's concerned in, in, in our industry. You really need to have a, a solid, solid operational um, rhythm to review the metrics and review the health of the asset. It's like I tell you know the folks that that I interface with at our management company. Hey, if the call's ten minutes, great, right? I, hey, th there may not be anything to review. If it's ten minutes, fantastic. Um, that's fine. Well, or if we need to cancel it, great. It's all good. Let's, it's going to be on the calendar. We need a rhythm. Um, but you know, we, we work through budgets. You want to, you know, you want to be with people who have not only a weekly, a bi-weekly or a monthly operating rhythm, but it's got to be around budgets. It's got to be around, Hey, how does this compare to the pro forma that we underwrote to? I mean, things change obviously, but we really need to keep a visibility to what we, you know, what we gave to our investors as they, you know, handed over hard, their hard earned money. Um, and so it's just a really important aspect of, of, uh, of operating in today's environment. Um, so in summary, uh, taking into account some of the M and M data and some, some of my thoughts on, you know, a good apartment operator, uh, especially with our variable rate, um, financing environment today, and we're, we're all now involved in that. Um, how do we successfully navigate? Well, you want to be involved with experienced operators that have liquidity, not only in the property's bank account, but in their own personal bank account. Strong communication and fundamentals around that, right? You know, it's uh, we all get into this business to have a little bit more tangible transparency around our investments. Um, always want to work with people that foster that environment. We talked about balance sheet management that is paramount, right? And don't wait until the 11th hour to try to, you know, circle the wagons on a balance sheet issue. Um, it, it, it takes, you know, you know, balance sheets can get out of hand overnight, but they can take months and years to rectify. Uh, same goes with P and L management expenses. 
more, more than likely expenses are not the same as they were a couple years ago. And so keeping an operating rhythm around that is extremely um, important. And then market fundamentals, uh, staying up to date with your market, changing markets, right? Uh, we, 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 you know, we did uh, business in Oklahoma years ago and now we, we don't, you know, and that's just a, that's just a market fundamental personal business decision. It's not a, it's not a knock on Oklahoma. It's just, Hey, staying up to date with, with your markets and picking groups that do business in markets that you like, um, and making sure that the groups you do business with understand their markets and the fundamentals behind it. So, um, with that, that's the end of my presentation, Libby. Um, my contact info is on there if anybody wants to get in touch, but I really appreciate the, the opportunity to speak with you all. Wonderful. Thank you, Adam. Uh, this has been obviously most insightful to hear from your perspective as to what, what, what are the fundamentals that you're looking at? Uh, what kind of conversations are you having with um, the parties in that space? Um, this is a good opportunity to um, obviously uh, ask you questions uh, the yep. audience we have still 12 people on online and i believe we have at least one on the phone uh, please if you have any questions this is a good time to ask directly from adam or you can chat or you can type uh, your question in the chat box and i'll be happy to read them out loud for you let me just pause for a second to see if anyone has any questions for you adam All right. I, 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 Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I came in late uh, after the introductions. My name is Keith Gross from Gershman Investment Corp. We are one of the largest HUD lenders in the country. We do close to a billion dollars every year. And I know we're talking to people today that typically we would not be talking to two or three years from now or two, two or three years ago. And mm -hmm. if anybody doesn't understand HUD, HUD is for all types of rents, the A rents to the low income rents. And we have something that today we can't be beat. We, again, I can't make that statement two or three years ago, but today we can make that statement. So if anyone needs a new construction loan or refinance or acquisition, it's certainly worth talking to us. Uh, we're the largest family owned uh, HUD lender in the country that hasn't been bought out or, or merged. We've been doing this since the sixties when HUD was created. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with HUD, but would love to hear some comments. Wonderful, Keith. Well, thank you again for joining us. And obviously we have your email address and phone on the chat box. So for those with interest, um, please be sure to take in his information. Um, just as a reminder, we will be sending um, a copy of the slides presented today uh, for everybody to review. And because the meeting has been recorded, then we will make this, um, available to all once the home office for FANG has had a chance to uh, edit it and then uh, release it. So it shouldn't take more than a couple of days. With that, um, Adam, I do have a quick question. Uh, yep. And of course, if anyone else has any questions, again, we this is a good time to ask those. Um, with regards to interest rates, uh, what are you seeing and obviously there's still demand for multifamily given that we need <laughs> places to live and, and the increase in population is uh, you know contributing to that but what are you seeing in terms of competition and uh, desire to acquire multifamily product today in spite of uh, the direction of the interest rates that we've seen are you still seeing a very competitive space with a lot of groups chasing multifamily product and if yes what kind of markets are you seeing uh, i'm assuming texas is among them but what other markets outside uh, that you're seeing in high demand yeah yeah you know you're you're, you're right the, the demand to acquire the properties has not gone away um mm -hmm. anecdotally mm -hmm. speaking we're, we're selling our last property in oklahoma now um and it's in a small market it's in a hundred thousand population market lot in oklahoma and um and we got uh, 15 offers so for a for a small market like that um during a time when it's it's kind of tough to navigate the debt scene I, I was very surprised i very surprised to see that number um and then my colleagues who have sold some some larger market properties same story 
um, you know, 10, 15, 20 offers, depending on, you know, property location and, and vintage. So that has not gone away. Um, there are certain, to your point, markets that are very popular. Um, and I even saw a question in the, in the chat box here about Austin. Um, you know, in my region, Austin, Texas is hotter than hot. And, um, you know, the, again, it's, it's likely we, we don't participate in Austin, but, but it's likely a market where, you know, the debt fundamentals haven't as much changed, um, the acquisition activity. It, it's, it's most likely very similar. The demand for apartment units and acquiring apartment units is probably still spot on. Um, if things e ease up in the, in, in the, um, capital markets, uh, it'll just, it'll take off. It'll really take off. It's Austin's very hot. I see. Interesting. Well, uh, we'll definitely continue the conversation on multifamily product, um, given the interest on, on the product itself. Again, thank you, Adam, for uh, you. your excellent presentation and informative and valuable uh, to all of us in the, in the group.